In earlier videos, I mentioned that much of the pre-modern history of psychology can be viewed as being influenced by various philosophies from around the world. What distinguishes psychology from philosophy is that psychology is rooted in the scientific method. Beliefs, assumptions, thoughts about psychological phenomenon must be proven to be correct and not just assumed to be correct because it may sound right or it may make sense to somebody. This video today is going to be a general overview of how the scientific method is used in psychology and how studies are conducted. This is a general overview video, so if you'd like to explore more specific topics about psychological research, you can check out the links below for topics like correlational studies, descriptive studies, experiments, and researcher bias. Let's start by first talking about what the scientific method is. The scientific method is a process that needs to be followed in order to unlock the truth behind how the world works. This process usually starts with observation. I like to make a point of saying that observation isn't really a formal step. What I mean is that people are just naturally inquisitive. We ask questions every day about everything. Sometimes we let our assumptions about what we observe lead to connections being made about the cause and effect of those observations. Once you start thinking about those connections and try to find a way to see if you can prove your assumptions to be correct, you're on your way down the scientific method. The next step is to start developing questions about your observations. We usually talk about this in terms of developing a theory. A theory is a series of statements or questions that propose an explanation for your observations. This theory forms the basis for developing a hypothesis, which is going to serve as the basis then for your study. The hypothesis is a statement of fact, making a prediction about the study you are about to perform to see if your explanation for the observations you've made is correct or not. A couple of things to keep in mind about the hypothesis. It typically needs to be only one sentence, and it needs to be falsifiable, which means it has the ability to be proven wrong. In other words, it needs to be a statement of fact rather than opinion. It also needs to be in an if-then format. Let me take a few steps back and come up with an example to help you all better understand what I'm talking about. Let's say I want to do an experiment on the effects of meditation on lowering your stress levels. I'm a huge fan of meditation, and I always like to encourage people to at least give it a shot to see if it may help them. Because of my experience with meditation, I have made some observations. I've noticed that I seem to have lower stress levels ever since I started meditating. I've also noticed that a lot of other people that I know that meditate regularly, likewise, say they have lower stress levels. My theory that would come out from these observations would involve questions like, does meditation lower stress level in people? To come up with a hypothesis, I could say something like, if meditation helps lower stress levels, then people that meditate will have less stress than people that don't. This is a falsifiable statement because I can prove it to be wrong. My hypothesis is also in an if-then format. What this means is that if something is true, in this case, if meditation does in fact lower your stress, then something else must be true, which in this case is that people that meditate would have lower stress levels than people that don't. Now that I have my hypothesis figured out, I can go about creating an experiment to actually test that hypothesis. So maybe I take a group of folks that have never meditated before and check their stress levels, then send them to a meditation class to show them how to do it and have them meditate for a certain amount of time, maybe days, weeks, months. After this, I can check their stress levels again and see if there was a change. Let's say that I did this and I noticed that people did have lower stress levels after meditating. Now I'm going to come up with a conclusion about this and publish my findings. The key thing to remember about the scientific method though is that it is a cycle. Once I publish my findings, other scientists are going to challenge it. And this is actually kind of a good thing because it helps see if there may be something that I missed in my study. 
perhaps it wasn't the meditation that lowered stress levels. It was just the fact that the person was able to spend some time alone and that's what lowered their stress levels. Maybe it was some other factor that could have influenced my results. When we talk about the scientific method, it's also important to talk about the different types of reasoning that we apply. Specifically, there are two types, inductive reasoning and deductive reasoning. Inductive reasoning is going from the specific to the general. Deductive reasoning is going from the general to the specific, so they're the exact opposite of one another. Both are used in science and even in other things like just daily problem solving. They're also inseparable. Think of them like inhaling and exhaling. One isn't better than the other, you kinda need both. Let me explain this a little better based on the example I gave earlier about meditation and stress. I mentioned that I noticed when I meditate that I'm less stressed. The basis for my hypothetical study is then to see if this can apply to other people. This is an example of inductive reasoning. If something works in this specific case, like meditation helping me have lower stress, then maybe it can work generally with other people too. Deductive reasoning would be more like me reading studies that talk about how meditation can lower stress levels and deciding to try it for myself. I'm applying general information to a specific situation. Being able to apply both deductive and inductive reasoning helps give a large amount of flexibility in applying the scientific method. This is good because when you think about all the things that psychology has to study, it would be impossible just to apply one type of thinking or one type of study that could apply to all those different topics. In fact, there are dozens and dozens of different types of scientific studies that are carried out in psychology. I broadly break these studies into three main categories, descriptive studies, correlational studies, and experiments. Descriptive studies are meant to describe things through observations. There are a whole bunch of different types of descriptive studies, like case studies, naturalistic observations, surveys, and archival research. Correlational studies look at the relationship that exists between at least two different things. They rely heavily on looking at statistical data to show these relationships. The final category are experiments. Experiments are important because they are the only type of study that can show a cause and effect relationship. I go into greater detail about these types of studies in other videos, and you can find the links for those videos below. Thanks for watching, everybody.